All right, good afternoon, everyone. So welcome to lecture 20. We're talking about the energy equation today. So this will allow us to do things like calculate the amount of work you have to put into a fluid system to heat it up or to pump water to a certain elevation, something like that. Um, and then just some, a reminder at the beginning of class that midterm two is coming up this Wednesday in two days. So like last time I've posted a practice exam at the beginning of this week's module. Um, and the structure of the actual exam is gonna be just like that, except you'll be able to upload your work. Um, and you can also count on like content being pretty, I, you know, I've asked the types of questions on the practice exam that are the type of questions I'm gonna ask on the actual midterm. Notably, there's going to be no explicit questions from the material in chapter four, the Reynolds Transport Theorem chapter, because we're really just using that in chapter five. All right, so let me go over here to the annotator, share my screen, and we'll get going. Okay, so the energy equation is covered in section 5.3 of the textbook. We're going to derive it just like we did for conservation of mass and conservation of linear momentum using the Reynolds transport theorem. We'll talk about some definitions. For example, power is rate of work. Um, and then we'll look at the forms of the energy equation that we're actually going to use in the class, and they look a lot like the Bernoulli equation with a couple of extra terms. All right, um, so let's get right down to it. So deriving the energy equation. So the first law of thermodynamics for a system, a fluid system, again, a collection of fluid particles, um, looks like this. Now this term looks really familiar, except instead of just rho d volume, we've got a little e in there. And as you can imagine, that little e is energy. Okay. So that's it, that's the first law of thermodynamics. It says that the time rate, this first term over here, the time rate of increase of total energy stored in the system is equal to the net time rate of energy addition by heat transfer into the system, plus the net time rate of energy increase added by work transfer into the system. Right, so the basic idea is the two things that can add energy to a system are heat transfer into the system. Um, so, you know, heating up your kettle, <laughs> you've got your kettle, you set it on a flame, you're adding um, energy by adding heat to the system, if the system is the water inside the kettle, um, or by work. And when we talk about work done on a fluid system, we're usually talking about the work done by a pump or a turbine or a fan or an impeller, something like that, right? Mechanical work done on the system. Uh, we can write this equation more compactly as follows. Oh, 
And we'll call this equation one. Uh, and let's just write out what little e is now. It's the total energy per unit mass for each particle in the system. And it's related to the internal energy, the kinetic energy, and the potential energy like this. Right, so we've got the internal energy per unit mass is little u with a caret. Um, the kinetic energy per unit mass, of course, is the velocity squared divided by two. And then the potential energy per unit mass is g times z, the acceleration of gravity um, due to gravity times the elevation z. So these terms look familiar, right? Two of these are familiar from the Bernoulli equation. And then one thing I want to point out before we move on is just if this is um, our control volume and it's containing our fluid system at the moment, right, the net heat transfer in Q dot net is just the sum of the additions and exits, right? So we can have heat flowing in through the surface of the control volume, heat flowing out. The net is the net in. In is considered positive. Um, all right, when we have a fluid system, collection of particles that's coincident with the control volume at an instant, then we can equate the net work in and the net heat transfer in. Right, so we can equate the network in, time, or time rate of change of work in, net rate of heat transfer in, in the system, the fluid system, and the coincident control volume, we'll call that equation two. Um, next, writing down the Reynolds transport theorem with big B equal to mass times little e, the energy, and little b equal to little e. Um, if you got an earlier, I posted my slides this morning, then realized they had a typo in this line here. Um, and I just corrected them about 15 minutes before class. So right rental transfer system equation for the system is Uh, notice we still have um, we still have that velocity dotted with a unit normal facing out from the control surface in this um, system in this energy equation, and this tells us that the time rate of increase of the total energy stored in this system is the same as the time rate of increase of the total energy stored in the contents of the control volume plus the net rate of flow of total stored energy out of the control volume through the control surface. If we combine, we'll call this equation three, equations one, two, and three, then we end up with d by dt over the CV And this is uh, equation 559. This is the control volume formulation of the first law of thermodynamics for fluid. This is not actually the equation that we're going to apply in practice. Um, we're going to make some simplifying assumptions and come up with two forms of the energy equation that are really useful and practical that we'll use all the time.
And as always, please interrupt me at any time to ask questions about the details. All right, almost done with our derivation here. Um, a few definitions, right? It's an adiabatic process is one where there's no heat transfer. So there's no rate of heat transfer into the system or out of the system. Um, and then power is the same as W dot. The time rate of work is the power by definition. Um, and that's important because the equations tend to be in terms of W dot or W dot, but oftentimes a problem will ask you to calculate the power, right? So just keeping in mind that those are the same. And then I want to next mention um, this idea of work. Often work is done on a fluid by a fan, impeller, turbine, some sort of rotating machinery that has some shaft about which blades or something else rotate and do work on the fluid, right? If that's the case, then we can write down the time rate of change or the power transferred by the pump or whatever machinery it is in terms of the torque of the shaft and the angular velocity of the shaft. All right, now finally, we'll get to a term of the energy equation. The first thing that we call the energy equation, which is still not one that we're going to use a whole bunch. But if we write the energy equation in terms of shaft work and expand out little e, um, this is what it looks like. And this is finally the energy equation. It's equation 5.64. But I'm not gonna box this equation because we really don't use this, right? To use this equation, this is the general form. It's multidimensional, it's unsteady, it's kind of, problems that are so complicated that they're for practical purposes beyond the scope of the course. But what I will point out is this grouping of terms, right? Static pressure over rho plus V squared over two plus GZ, that grouping of terms looks really familiar, right? And we are familiar with it from the Bernoulli equation. All right, so now I'm going to write down the useful forms of the energy equation that we actually do use. There's two forms, one in terms of head loss and one in terms of shaft work, and we use them all the time. So here we go. So if we can assume that a process is happening along a stream tube, we can, that it's somewhat one dimensional, that there's just one inlet and one outlet, then we can simplify the energy equation that we wrote down on the previous slide into this one dimensional form.
All right, and this one I am going to box. Well, let's see. I'm not gonna box that one because that's not one of the final two forms that we do use. Um, let me drag this down here. because what I want to really make a note of is how we got this form of the equation. And it's by taking that integral term over the control surface. So on the last page, and writing down the result for processes occurring along a stream tube, right? So this is where we get this form. Okay, right, so we can rewrite that integral term here like this, and then we just substitute that into the energy equation, the previous form that we wrote down on the last page, and we get it out like that. Okay. Now this form of the energy equation that we've written down has the internal energy, little u hat. Sometimes we want it in terms of enthalpy. For example, if we're dealing with a compressible flow problem, so we can just use the relationship between enthalpy and internal energy um, right this is the definition of enthalpy and if you find yourself thinking you need a little thermo refresher you can go back to module one for the course uh, where I've got some preliminary reading chapters and one of them is a thermal review. All right, so writing this in terms of enthalpy. Um, and again, I'm not going to box this one because we're not going to really use it very much in the course, but this is used for compressible flow problems where you would want um, to be able to keep track of changes in, en in enthalpy in a system like this. All right, finally, here we go. On this page, we're going to get to the two forms that we do use in the class. So if we divide the energy equation on the previous page by the mass flow rate m dot, we're gonna get the following.
Um, so we divide through the internal energy form of the energy equation by m dot, um, and we end up with this. And we'll just note that little q net in is equal to big Q dot net in divided by m dot. Okay. And then finally, if we assume one dimensional incompressible steady in the mean. So what do we mean by steady in the mean? Um, if you can imagine the flow through a hairdryer, right? You're holding a hairdryer up, it's sucking air, cool air in the back and expelling warm air from the front. And it's doing this, the airflow rate is steady, although we know that there's a fan, there's a pump inside that's heating up the air, right? We know that pump is spinning, but we're not considering the motion of that spinning, right? We're just saying that this is steady in the mean flow. We're gonna do that a lot with problems where we calculate shaft work. So if there's a pump, turbine, fan, anything that's spinning, we say, okay, this flow is steady in the mean, even though that there's some machinery that's rotating, we're just gonna call this whole flow steady in the mean because it's producing a steady flow rate in and out. And you'll see in a moment when I start on some examples. All right, here's the first form that we are going to use of the energy equation. And this one is in terms, again, of that shaft work. So if you've got a piece of machinery. Uh, and this is called the mechanical energy equation. And look what it is, really. It's really the Bernoulli equation, right? If you look at the first one, two, three, four, five, six, first six terms are just the Bernoulli equation. And then we've got an extra term for energy added to the fluid and an extra term for losses due to friction, right? So Bernoulli equation plus energy in plus losses is the mechanical energy equation. And this one I did box because we're going to use it all the time. And then finally, I just want to note that the loss term here is equal to minus Q net in minus U in plus U out. Um, and then this work shaft net in this little W is equal to big W dot divided by M dot. And this is equation 5.85, I believe. Let me double check that. Oh, no, that's not 5.85. It's just not numbered in the textbook, so we'll take that number away. Uh, I'm going to box both of these because they're really important. If you're dealing with solving problems like this, you're going to refer back to these definitions all the time so they get boxed. And you can find them if you've got a paper copy of the textbook, you can find them on page 245. All right, and then finally, if we take this form of the energy equation, the mechanical energy equation, and we just divide everything by G, acceleration due to gravity, um, we get the final form of the energy equation. And you'll notice that these terms 
all have units of length. or height. And this one's getting boxed. All right. This is equation 5.84. So this is the other form of the energy equation that we're going to use all the time. This also assumes 1D incompressible steady in the mean flow with friction, you know, viscous losses and with some work done by machinery. Um, the difference is that these extra terms, this is also just, you know, a form of the Bernoulli equation, the first six terms, and then the two extra terms are in terms of a height. And so we can think that, of this as a head loss. If you remember when we talked about the terms of the Bernoulli equation, you can imagine, um, you can imagine that different pressures are represented by different heights of fluids, right? If we have a column of mercury, its height is given in millimeters of mercury, something like that, that's a pressure. I've got a question, what is the subscript on the last H term? Is that a two um, down here? That's an L and that's because it's the head loss term. So. Let's write down what these terms are. H sub S is the little w divided by G, which is equal to big W dot divided by M dot G, which is equal to big W dot divided by gamma. Q. Now this is equation 5.85 and I'm going to box all of these because we're also going to use these definitions all the time. And then finally H sub L is that loss term from the equation above divided by G. All right. So basically if you are given a problem, you decide which form of the energy equation you're going to use based on what's being asked for in the problem, right? If you're asked for um, something involving the work or the loss, you'll use this first form. If you're asked for, you know, head loss or elevation, pardon me, you'll use the second term. All right, great. So it looks like I've got enough time to go into the examples. Um, and then if you guys, you know, if you have a lot of questions about the exam on Wednesday, let me know in the chat and I'll try to go through the examples quicker. So we have a few more minutes to talk about the exam. I'm just planning to go over two examples now and then go to the wrap up slide where I just talk about the exam. It's not really new information, just sort of what's gonna be on the exam. Um, you can see the same information on the practice exam. Uh, the question was, is this material that we're covering today on the exam? No, it is not, because you haven't had a chance to submit homework uh, or work with these problems at all yourself, so it won't be on the exam. So the exam covers through section 5.2, which is conservation of linear momentum from a control volume perspective. All right, so I'm gonna go through, um, oh dear, the practice test is not open. I did not know that. I was wondering why no one had taken it yet. Thank you for letting me know. I'll, I'll go ahead and open it up immediately after class. All right, so would you guys like to talk about the exam for a couple minutes and then see if we have time to work through these examples? Why don't we do that? Um, I'll see what questions you have on the exam and we'll see how much time we have left and come back and do some examples. All right, so this is all I've got on the exam. Of course, you're aware that your quiz eight, homework eight are due tonight. 
Um, and then the midterm is this Wednesday. One thing I want to note that I've got bolded here, there are no explicit questions on the chapter four material. So if you remember chapter four was sort of the dimensionality of a velocity field, acceleration. Um, and although that was important for chapter five, I'm not gonna be expecting or asking explicit questions on the content from chapter four. All right, I've got a question in the chat that says, do we have extra time for submitting work on the actual exam? Yes, practice exam is just 50 minutes with no way to upload work and no extra 15 minutes. Actual midterm is gonna be just like midterm one. So it's gonna be 65 minutes, right? And it's up to you to sort of decide when you're gonna stop working and start uploading your work for partial credit. Um, so topics covered on the exam are hydrostatic forces on curved surfaces, buoyancy, Bernoulli equation, and then the control volume, conservation of mass, conservation of linear momentum. Um, I will tell you that I'm not gonna ask an explicit conservation of mass question from section 5.1 because you have to use that content in section 5.2 anyway, conservation of linear momentum. Um, so if, you know, the control volume question I'm going to ask is going to be a conservation of linear momentum question. Uh, and then just keep in mind that in one week you've got those half page project proposals due. It's just really for me to say, yeah, that project makes sense. Go ahead, you know, carry on. But notice that Dr. Burgoyne has the requirement that you include at least one equation in your proposal. So you'll want to read over the uh, guidelines. All right, questions on the exam? And please, I'll just say, if you ever notice something like that the practice exam is not available, it's likely just, you know, I copy pasted it from last time and it got the wrong due date and I, I had no idea. So please just let me know right away if there's something like that that's really inconvenient for you. All right, uh, what about the moment of momentum? Will there be any moment of momentum on the exam? Absolutely not, no. So we are gonna be dealing with moment of momentum or torques, conservation of angular momentum from a control volume perspective at the end of the class in chapter 12. And I did mention it in class, but just so that you could remember um, when we get up to chapter 12. Any other questions about the exam? So, but basically, you know, you're going to have one question that's on calculating, you know, work through. You're going to have your concept, multiple choices, right? Five of them, just like last time. Then you're going to have four work through problems. One for hydrostatic forces on curved surface. Um, one for buoyancy, one for Bernoulli, one for conservation of linear momentum, just like the practice exam. All right, looks like you don't have any explicit questions on the exam right now. If you think of one, you know, feel free to, to go ahead, but I'm going to go back to our examples and we'll see what we can do. Can I repeat the questions that will appear on the exam? Sure. It's going to be one question on calculating hydrostatic forces on a curved surface, one question on um, buoyancy, one question on, actually I have to skip forward in my notes. <laughs> uh, one question on the Bernoulli equation, third question. And then the fourth question is going to be control volume approach to conservation of linear momentum, All right? So those are the four types of work through problems you're gonna have, All right? So basically one section 2.10 question, one section 2.11, you know, one Bernoulli, these are all these sections, 31.36 are Bernoulli equation, and one section 5.2. All right.
Uh, let's go through, you're welcome. Let's get through this example problem, see what time it is. Maybe you guys will have thought of more exam questions by then. If not, we'll go ahead and go right into the second example problem. All right, so here we have a fan and it's sucking air in here in the back. It's coming through. We've got the blades of the fan and the fan motor here. Notice the blades are attached to the shaft of the fan and that's what's doing the work, right? So our shaft work term is going to come from here. Um, and then we've got air exiting with an appreciable velocity over here at section two. So entrance in section one, you can see it says V1 is zero. So what we're assuming is that behind the fan, the velocity is negligible. We're dealing with a really large volume of air in the room that's being sucked through. We're going to approximate that velocity as zero. So this is far behind the fan back here at section one. And then here it gets um, the, the cross-sectional area that this same volume of air is going through is much smaller. So we have an appreciable velocity exiting at section two with a velocity of 12 meters per second. Our diameter here of the air stream is 0.6 meters. So what's the magnitude of the shaft work minus the loss? So what's the useful work performed by the fan? Well, if you look back at our two candidate equations, right? I said you sort of see what the question's asking, then decide which form of the equation you're going to use. We obviously want to use this first form, equation 582, because it's in terms of shaft work minus loss. So we'll do that. We'll write down equation 582. to the contents of the control volume indicated here in the figure by the red dashed line. We're just going to rearrange the terms of the equation. And we get P2. So we're replacing the subscript out with two and the subscript in with one. So P2 over rho plus V2 squared over two plus G Z2 minus P1 over rho plus V1 squared over 2 plus GZ1. So can anybody tell me any of these terms that we can immediately just set to zero? V1, yes, thank you, Leah and Matt. V1, right? Because it said in the problem definition and in the figure, you can see V1 is approximately zero. So we'll immediately set that to zero. What about the elevation terms? Is there a difference in elevation between, you know, the inlet at section one and the exit at section two? Or can we just cancel the Z1 and Z2 terms? Right? There's no difference in elevation. Exactly, Michelle, thank you. We can just cancel them. Good, and then finally, um, there's another set of terms that we can cancel. If we look at our control volume, you know, in principle, we have pressure acting inwards everywhere on the control volume. Pressure always acts normally inwards. Because the flow situation on these sides of the control volume is symmetrical, all those pressure forces on the sides are going to cancel. But also, the pressure acting at the inlet and outlet is just atmospheric pressure, right? We've got an open system here. We're not, you know, this isn't flow through a pipe. So P1 and P2 are just atmospheric pressure. We can cancel those out as well. So the equation really simplifies a lot and we get that the shaft work minus the loss is just 
v2 squared over 2. So we can plug in the value for v2 that we're given and then use our conversion. And we get that it's 72 Newton meters per kilogram. So this is in terms of work per unit mass, right? If you look at the units as Newton meters, which are the units for work. Um, if you remember the fundamental definition of work from physics when you took it in high school or, you know, as a freshman, you, they tell you the story of like taking a block with some mass and pushing it, right? And so it's the force um, provided by that mass times the distance that you push it, that's the work that you performed, right? So that's not always the situation we're looking at and the type of work we're looking at, but it is true that the units of work are force times length. Uh, and here it's per unit mass, so that gets divided by kilograms. And this is the useful work performed by the air on the fan, right? If there were no losses, if that loss term were zero, um, then this whole 72, you know, 72 Newton meters per kilogram would be higher because we wouldn't be subtracting friction losses, viscous losses. All right, any questions on that example? You guys have any more questions on the exam that you wanna talk about right now? Are you good for me to go on to the second example? All right, well, I'll go on to the second example, but just feel free to jump in with whatever question you have at any time. All right, now here we've got two lakes, an upper lake and a lower lake, and there's a 30 foot difference in elevation between the surface of the lower and upper lakes. And there's a pump down here, and it's pumping water from the lower lake to the upper lake. Um, we consider this to be one dimensional, right? This is our inlet here. So you can see our control volume that we've sketched. It's the entire volume of the lower lake. And then it's this channel that it's flowing up through, including the pump, um, all the way up to the entire volume of the upper lake. You can see by these triangles that both lakes, of course, the surfaces are open to the atmosphere. So we're told that the pump here adds 10 horsepower to the water as it pumps the lake from the lower lake to the upper lake. We're told the elevation difference is 30 feet and the head loss is 15 feet. So that's a loss of energy due to friction. And we're asked to determine, determine the flow rate and power loss. All right, so we go back two slides now. And we ask ourselves, which one of these equations are we going to use? Well, they've explicitly asked for head loss, right? So we want one of these head loss terms. So we're going to use the second form of the equation. All right, so we're using equation 5.84. In terms of head loss, we'll just write out the whole equation. Again, we're replacing out and in with two and one for the subscripts. All right, so right away, we can get rid of a couple of terms, right? We can assume that the velocity at the surface of lake one and lake two is zero. So both of these velocity terms um, go to zero. And we can cancel the pressures as well. because we've just got pre P atmospheric at the surfaces of these lakes. So all we're left with is HS equals HL plus Z2 minus Z1. Call this equation two. Um, we'll use equation 5.85 here, which tells us that H sub S 
is capital W um, dot over gamma times Q. So that's 10 horsepower over 62.4 pounds per cubic feet times Q. And then I'm just going to write times a conversion factor. So this H sub S term is 88.1 over Q, the volumetric flow rate. Um, and then from two, we have that 88.1 over Q is equal to 15 feet plus 30 feet. So Q is 1.96 cubic feet per second. All right, so that's the flow rate. And finally, we need the power loss. So the power loss due to friction So we've got W loss equals gamma Q H L. So again, that's 62.4 pounds per cubic feet. Now times 1.96 feet cubed per second times 15 feet. Um, that becomes 1830 feet pounds per second, which if you use a conversion factor, gives you 3.33 horsepower, right? They didn't really specify what units they wanted it in, but um, there we go. All right, any questions about that example? I'll write down the conversion factor before I post the notes. Okay, then, if there are no questions there, we're back to this final slide. Does anybody have any last minute questions on the exam that's coming up on Wednesday? Um, Professor Staples, I just have a question not on the exam, but rather on the Reynolds transfer theorem. Yes. So because of the properties of, because of the assumptions of assumptions that we made for the Reynolds transfer theorem being a fixed control volume yes and having a uniform property such as uniform properties it's because of those properties we were able to derive um, for the conservation of mass and conservation of linear momentum is that is that is that why is that how they're all leading to it? because I just kind of plug in you know plugged in and, and then look for the examples to do my homework questions I don't really exactly kind of I kind of have a difficulty understanding the Reynolds transfer theorem. So is that is that those is that why we were able to derive all these? Yes, the Reynolds transfer properties? theorem relates um, the properties of a flow inside a control volume with what's flowing through the surface of the control volume. I see. So what we've done is we've used the that this relation that relates what's inside a control volume with what's flowing through the surface together with basic conservation laws, like conservation of mass, momentum, angular momentum, and energy, to mm -hmm. combine them to come up with these control volume ways. So we have the conservation laws already, like today's lecture, we have the first law of thermodynamics, but we don't have a way to apply it to a control volume of fluid. The run transport theorem lets us do that. I, okay, I see it. Thank it's you. Sort of like if you're familiar with advanced math, it's sort of like Green's theorem, right? So it relates what's inside, the changes right. happening inside of all them to flux through the surface. Oh, okay. That, that makes much sense. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I got a question about the exam. We can do it anytime within the 24 hours. Yes, absolutely. It's going to open, you know, in the middle of the night, midnight on Wednesday. So you can take it anytime up until 1159 p.m. Wednesday evening. So you've got the full 24 hours, just like last time, I'm going to be online live during class time, but you don't have to take it at that time. You can take it at any time. I'll probably be able to check and respond to your emails pretty quickly, even if it's not during class time. Although I do have a few other meetings.
Any other questions? I'm happy to stay on for a few extra minutes. All right, well, feel free to email me if you have any questions um, and I'll be happy to answer them. And I will make sure that the practice exam is live right now. All right, thank you everyone. Thank have you. a good afternoon.